Well, all right, we're at 10 o'clock central. Uh, I'm going to say good morning, everybody, because it is uh, uh, morning here to me. I know it's not morning for everybody, but uh, we appreciate y'all joining. Uh, Phil ran away from us just a few minutes ago, claiming he needed to do work. So uh, he's, he's left it on the rest of us to, uh, to drive this train today and see what we can do. So welcome to uh, VRUG 21.05. So I've put together, let's see if I can get it to move forward, an agenda for today. Um, Kais, have you joined? Hmm. We're missing Kais, and we, he's going to be our first presenter on this. So, uh, hopefully, he'll be here in just a minute uh, for everything. If not, Lenny, we may re reorder things until Kais gets here. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. So, one of the things I want to talk about today is uh, branding for the V rug, uh, and then I wanted to give you all the next V rug save the date, and we wanted to briefly talk about the Las Vegas LV rug save the date. Um, then we have a uh, presentation set up for today. Uh, uh, Kais is going to talk about AR <coughs> Smarts. Uh, Lenny is going to talk about things to consider for BMC Helix 2008. And then Lenny is going to present again on adding fields to Smart IT ticket console and forms. And then I'm going to come back and present at the end uh, about preserving custom fields during an upgrade. Um, scenario being uh, dealing with uh, out of the box uh, forms and overlays and needing to get your custom fields back and be able to uh, uh, get the out of the box uh, modifications to, to show up in your overlays and so forth. So talking about VRUG branding, we've uh, uh, talked about we needed some kind of an image to present VRUG. And so I kind of threw this together as an idea. Doesn't mean we're gonna use it. Um, I liked the old traditional uh, four R's from long ago. So I stole that and put together this image of V-Rug. What do y'all think? But then BMC uh, called me and said, hey, we're going to be rebranding the on-prem systems and call it Helix on-prem and the Remedy name will no longer be used. So, okay, so we got to talking about it, trying to figure out, well, this is gonna now be a Helix users group, which means we need a V-hug. Just kidding about the V-hug yeah, part. I was gonna say, no, I think that's a bit. <laughs> yeah. I think but, we all need a V-hug. Yeah, but seriously, <laughs> BMC is doing this. Um, but we've all been doing remedy for so long, we're still going to call this a V rug. So I'm, st uh, I'm still good with V rug. Yeah, we're, not we're, old, we're old timers, new newbies can come in and uh pick up on the pace as well. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so for saving the date, our next V rug uh is going to be scheduled for August the 26th at 5 p.m. Central. Um, if you'll remember from the email I sent out. We're going to be rotating between a 10 a.m. Central and a 5 p.m. Central to try to uh, help our uh, European uh, viewers and uh, hopefully presenters to uh, uh, not always have to get up at 2 a.m. to uh, to join us for stuff. Uh, we need presenters and topics for the next one. If you'll send an email to uh, to Phil Bautista or to me uh, for that. Um, we'd love to uh, put that into the list of potentials, uh, whether we get to it actually at the next one or if it's a little further out. The other thing we want to talk about is the Las Vegas LV rug save the date. Um, Lenny has, is uh, uh, driving this Las Vegas rug um, scheduled for December 7th through the 9th. Uh, Lenny uh, is going to let us know what hotel the uh, uh, actual rug itself will be held in. Uh, the attendees are responsible for own hotel accommodations and to 
cover the cost of uh, renting the rooms for the hotels to do the events in, uh, we're asking $200, uh, whether you're in person or virtual. So and you got Lenny's contact information here for that. A uh, little bit additional info, there's going to be two breakout session rooms, the live stream for those that can't make it. Uh, we're going to do, uh, for those that can make it, we're going to do a network cocktail gathering and uh, some other special gatherings uh, for those that are, that are able to make it. And any presentation submissions, uh, send those to Lenny for that uh, LV rug date. Lenny, you got any more info about that? Yeah, the uh, the location is down between either New York, New York, or Tropicana. We're working with our contacts there to um, work out a better deal for whoever is going to attend. We are required to purchase um, at least food and beverage. So whoever does attend, if we're down to, let's say five people that are only gonna show up, you're gonna get a big lunch and probably a big dinner as well. Uh, but the more people that show up, the lobster goes out the door and you will probably get steak or maybe peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I don't know, but <laughs> we do have a set uh, price on that. My company is going to sponsor uh, half of it. And uh, I have Phil, uh, working with me on getting everything organized. I have Cybertrain pitching in to do some presentations as well. Uh, if anybody else wants to present, by all means, uh, send me the topics. I'm not going to control it like I did in our past rugs. Uh, it's your PowerPoint presentation. It's your logos. It's however you want to do it. I may read up on it if you send it to me ahead of time to give you some technical or uh, graphical uh, input information on it as well. So I just wanted to throw that out at you. Um, but I hope to have registration up and running in another month, as well as a schedule uh, plan and a website. So be on the lookout for that over the next month or two. Any you, questions? Lenny. Okay, back to you. All right, thank you, Lenny. All right, and as he said, any questions for that? Uh, otherwise, thank you. That's it for covering that. Kais, have you been able to make it? Or someone representing AR Smarts that was going to present? He just oh, showed I up. see Kais. There you are, Kais. Excellent. So, Kais, uh, I'm going to stop sharing. So, now you should be able to present. Uh, you're on mute, though, Kais. Yeah, we're not we're not hearing you, Kais. Something's not quite right. I think he dropped out again. He's been coming in and out of the meeting for the last uh, five minutes or so. Yeah, he's 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 up here. I see his picture, but we're not hearing him. It's like his microphone's not picking up. All right, do you hear me now? There's Kais, yes. Yes, great. Thank you, Windows. Yes. Okay, so I can share my screen, um, which is this one. All right. Yes, there we go. Do you guys see my screen? Yes. So, so we're on. So I can present, um, let's say slideshow. All right. So um, thank you very much. Um, I've been told that I had uh, 15 minutes to present and that there were uh, 15 minutes for uh, questions, right? So I rehearsed my presentation this afternoon and I finished in 14 minutes, 55 seconds. So we should be okay. Uh, so thank you very much. Good morning uh, if you're in the US. Good afternoon if you are in Europe. Um, my name is Kais. Uh, some of those may know me, um, the other ones, well, you don't know what you miss. 
today I'm going to talk to you about AR Smart. So, um, well, in one sentence, AR Smart is the Swiss Army knife for the remedy technical people. Um, it's the tool you cannot live without, right? So what I've got to do, what I've got for you today, I've got um, a few slides and then I've got a, a live demo of uh, just uh, two tiny functionalities of AR Smarts, just to give you a taste of it. So overview of AR Smarts. Uh, AR Smarts is an AR system companion product. Eh? So clearly, you don't use Remedy, you don't need AR Smarts. Eh? Let's be clear about that. Right? AR Smarts is made out of five modules. You've got them here on your screen now. Eh? In red, we have the navigator. So when you when you use the navigator, you can browse through your Remedy objects. Okay, uh, forms, fields, menus, filters, um, active links if you still have those, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you, can, you can follow the link, you can double click, you can open a form, open a, a field, open a menu, uh, open all the fields where the, the, that are using this menu and things like that, okay? That's one thing you can do with the navigator. The second thing you can do with the navigator is to search through your Remedy objects. And the third thing you can do with the navigator is to compare definition files. And that is what I'm going to show you in a few minutes is how to search and how to compare, right? Then the second module in green is the export module. Now the export module allows you to export definitions uh, without any limitation of size. Uh, what's interesting about the export module is that, that you can schedule automatic export. So you can say, okay, I want to export uh, the definitions of my production server uh, every Friday between 2 a.m. And, and 5 a.m., right? And Remedy will, will start the export at 2 right, sorry, AR Smarts, will start the export at two. So um, that's the interesting bit about the export module. In orange, you have the Grafer module. Now, uh, when you use the Grafer, it gives you a graphical representation of one form in your Remedy application, and then all the forms with which it has a relationship whether it's a set field, a push field, a query menu, table field, whatever, okay? The graphs are color-coded and clickable. In blue, you have the documenter. The documenter allows you to gen generate humanly readable documentation. I may give you a glimpse of that. Uh, in purple, you have the data, um, data manager. So the four modules that I just quoted work offline with definition files. The data manager works online with data, but that's another subject that's for another presentation. So today we are going to focus on, on the navigator. Right. Um, so the first functionality that I would like to show you is the compare functionality. We will see how you can compare two definition files. Now we built the compare functionality so that it brings you meaningful results, right? Because when you compare big applications, well, two versions of a big application, right? then you get 3,576 differences out of which 52 are interesting for you. The question is which 52 out of these 3,000, right? Now with AR Smart, we gave you the possibility to ignore areas. We gave you the possibility to select what you want to compare so that you only have meaningful results. Okay? And by the way, you can also compare overlay with base objects. I'm not gonna show you this now, but uh, if you're interested, 
don't don't hesitate to drop me a mail and we can talk further about this. The next functionality I would like to talk to you about is the the search functionality. Now, using the search functionality, you can search through your Remedy workflow. You can search everywhere, okay, in, in every object. And once you select an object, as you can see it on the screenshot on your, slide, on your screen, you can search basically every area of that object. And if there is one area that you cannot search, that means that we forgot about it. So drop us an email and we will add it. Right, um, and then I'll give you a glimpse of the documentation. All right, so that was it for the slides. So um, this is the AR Smarts um, main main screen, the AR Smarts main window. Okay. You can see that I opened a number of definition files. Okay, some of them being rather being rather small. 122 forms, 500 filters, all right. Um, I opened a big one, eh? 3,000 forms, 20,000 filters, and then I opened this one that is not too big, 300 forms. Venomous. All right, so um, what I'm going to do now, the first thing I want to show you is the compare functionality. Eh? So. This is our compare window. I have to first uh, select two definition files to compare. Now, I could compare three or four definition files if it would be interesting for you. Eh? If you want to compare uh, 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 development, uh, QA and production, you can do that. But for this demo, I will compare only two, right? Um, I can select whether I want to compare the complete applications or just the common forms. Now I'm going to complete to, to compare the complete applications. I can choose to ignore a number of attributes like timestamp, help text, and all these things uh, for which whether they, they, are, they are modified or not, I'm not really interested. Okay. Um, I can I can decide to signal different order in set field lists that because one day a customer of us needed that so we developed that for them right and then i can perform a basic selection of what i want to compare so uh, for this demo i will just compare the filters okay? just to give you an idea so ar smarts compared the filters and this is my result so as you can see, the result is common. So in in red, we have the filters are present in the right hand side application. In blue, we have the filters that are present in the other application only. And in green, we have the filters that are present in both applications, but that are not the same. Right? So we can see here that um, uh, these two filters um, do not have, well, are present in both applications. This filter is present in both applications, but it doesn't have the same qualification. Right? This filter is present in both applications, but the second action is different, so I can double click here and I can double click there, right? And I can open the filter side by side. AR Smarts brings me directly to the second action, which is the one that is different. And we can see that uh, the, the list of fields that are being filled by the set field action is not the same in both filters, right? So, um, so that's a quick look of, of the compare uh, functionality. Uh, what I can do from here, I can generate documentation. Now I can generate a summary documentation. Now 
you see that you see that I, I've been practicing, all right? So um, so this is uh, the summary documentation, right? And if I generate the summary documentation, I have basically the list of filters that are different. So 212 filters, and each time AR Smarts tells me what the difference is. So a number of them are present only in one application. Um, other filters are, uh, have one action that is different. You know, here is the push field action, right? So this is the summary documentation. And then I can generate a detailed documentation. Now, if I generate a detailed documentation, AR Smarts will generate two, will generate two uh, files. And in every file, I will have the detailed documentation of all the objects of one of the application that is being compared. So here, AR Smarts documented in detail the filters of this application that are the result of this comparison. And if I, if I scroll down a little bit, I can see that every filter is documented in all its details, okay? So every detail is there. Once again, if we forgot one, tell us, we'll add it. That means we, we just missed it, right? So obviously uh, the ideal situation is to generate and a summary and the two detailed documentation when you want to document the result of a compare operation. So that's, that's a very basic compare operation. Now, I would like to go one step further, okay? And instead of comparing all the filters of these two applications, I would like to be more precise, more specific in what I'm going to compare. So I open the search interface and I'm going to search for all the filters that do a push field to a field called, uh, sorry, to a form called send mail, right? So first of all, AR Smarts will find in both applications all the filters that do a push field to a form called send mail. Okay. And then, so this is the result, okay? So we can see that there are very little filters doing such push field. And then AR Smarts will compare these filters. So I click on okay, and then AR Smarts compares the filters that do a push field operation to the send mail form. And so I can see that I've got one filter that exists in one application and not the, in the other one. Here, I've got a filter that exists in the left-hand side application, if I, if I dare say, and not in the other one. And then here, I've got filters where, for example, the push field action is different, okay? And once again, I can open, I can open the filters and I see that the fields that are being pushed are different, right? So basically, uh, you can you can go uh, very very precisely uh, to specify what you want to compare, and the idea is to give you uh, a very relevant list of differences between between two or three or four uh, um, um, definition files, and and this way uh, help you, for example, to spot what you modified since the beginning of the week or to spot what you modified since the last time that you migrated or, or things like that, all right? So I don't know, I don't know if, I'm, if I ran out of time or, or I don't know if I, um, if I use all my time or not, but um, that was it for me. So um, I would say, thank you, where is, where is my, my, my PowerPoint? My PowerPoint is here. 
Um, so no, that's not the one. Um, um, all right. So I want to say thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, thank you for your interest in AR Smarts. And uh, please fire your questions. Okay, Kai, very good. Um, Dan Nichols uh, put a, a question in the chat uh, that I think may have been answered by now, but I'll, I'll read it to you. He's asking, does AR Smarts work with the new construct of the progressive views, meaning the, uh, the new progressive view, progressive web app views that are uh, coming out with the uh, 2102 uh, product? Um, and most of the answers appear to be that because it's just a view in AR system that uh, AR Smart should have no problem interpreting it. Uh, does that sound right to you? Yes, that's, that's what I expect. In all honesty, um, we, we haven't been very far in testing that yet, but uh, uh, as, we, as we work with definition files, um, there might be some new functionalities that we will ignore eh, and that we will add as we discover them and as we document them in AR Smarts. But um, I would expect it to work, yes. Okay. Anybody else got any questions for uh, Kais? I have one. Uh, Kais, this is Lenny. What if, if we do an upgrade and I wanted to check what BMC changed on the underlying uh, base structure, uh, since we do a lot of overlays and so forth, can I eliminate the comparison of the overlay and just look at base structure versus base structure? Yes, you can absolutely do that. Um, let, I'll show you when you want to do it. Okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to start showing things now. But right, that's yes, fine. Yes, you can, you can decide to browse only the base structure or only the overlay structure or both. And so if you decide to browse only the base structure, then when you compare, you compare only the base structure. Okay, yeah, that, that would become helpful because if we're doing an upgrade, I wanna see what BMC changed on stuff that we had to overlay. So if they change something on it, we may have to add that into our overlay. So that would be yeah. helpful. All right, thanks. We can certainly help with that. And I, I do have uh, one more question. It's actually in two part, just uh, to help me out a little bit. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, as we're doing custom app development and things like that, we need to have, uh, it looks like your graphical uh, uh, capability will provide a, uh, a workflow visualization of uh, what forms link to which forms and how that works out. Is that, is that accurate in what I understood you to say? Um, well, that, that I, can, I can show real, real quick. Uh, here, is, um, here is what it looks like. All right. So I'm just generating, you guys still see my screen, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So um, I, yeah, I'm sorry. It, it first put it on the other screen, so it's not scaled correctly, but you see, I, I selected the service request form, okay? And that, that's a form with relationships with another, a number of other forms. So here you've got the different, the different forms with which it has a relationship, okay? And you can, you can move them around like that, all right? Um, and then obviously it's color coded. So when it's red, it's active links. When it's purple, it's a menu. When it's black, it's a table, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you can right-click on it, and you can open the object that causes this link to be there. Um, I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but you see that uh, you have an arrow, and that the arrow is attached to the category field. So that means that the the, the active link is attached to this form. Okay. So here, the arrows are attached to the remote form. So that means that the workflow is attached to the remote form. And then the direction of the arrow shows the, the way 
the direction in which the data is flowing. Okay. So it's data from flowing from quick call to service request. Got it. And then uh, does the data manager provide the functionality to uh, provide a uh, uh, take a data dictionary on development pro uh, develop products uh, that we have? So will it uh, will it help with uh, data, uh, building out a data dictionary? Um, the goal of the data manager is is not to build a data dictionary. Well, my colleagues are here, eh? André and Jean-Louis are here. So if I say something silly, then you correct me. Um, the goal of the data manager is more to uh, to access your to access your remedy data without the the remedy GUI. And the, remedy, the remedy GUI is fine. It's very beautiful when you are a user, but when you are an admin guy, the remedy GUI can sometimes be a little bit in the way. So the data manager is there to allow you to access your hidden fields, the fields that are in no view um, and things like that, and okay. to allow you to create, uh, uh, to search and to modify records and uh, you can you can modify individually. You can modify all. You can copy paste between forms and things like that. All right. And, and if we're interested in getting the data manager, got it. And if we're interested in getting this into our uh, development environment, uh, do we go through? Are you guys part of the market zone, or do we go directly through to you to see uh, how we can license this into our uh, development environment? You come directly to us. Okay, Roger. Thanks. Thank you very much. All right, any other questions for Kais? All right, Kais, um, Zoom is very particular with us. You have to stop sharing in order for okay, us to go okay. to the next person. I just stopped sharing. All right, and so Lenny, it is over to you uh, to uh, present uh, things to consider for BMC Helix 2008. Okay, good morning, afternoon, evening, whatever your time period is. Uh, uh, thanks, Bob, and of course, Phil, who's listening in for letting me uh, come in and do a couple of presentations. My little background, just to give it to you, is I used to work for Remedy Corporation back in 1990 eight when I retired from the Air Force and then moved into BMC Software, then left them in 2007, became independent, and I've been independent ever since. And I work on a variety of different projects, uh, still teaching whenever somebody needs training or things like that. So whenever I do presentations, I generally try to get into the teaching mode instead of the um, sales mode or anything like that. So that's what I'm going to present here is a few things that I've encountered with a couple of my customers going to 20.08, and I'd like to share those in here. Some of them are documented, some of them are not documented, uh, but there's quite a few other things that I keep building on this. So I will represent this in December with the changes as well as what you're going to see here. So what I did was I broke up this session into three different uh, categories. Things on 2008 for, or 20.08 for BMC Smart IT, for DWP, and for ITSM. Now under the ITSM, I also threw in the AR system because a lot of people don't realize that the AR system is the underlying uh, basis. And it's still part of referencing as ITSM because we say to access AR system, you actually access BMC ITSM mid-tier. So in the smart IT uh, realm of things, uh, several things, this gives you the step-by-step -step, and you should have the PDF for this uh, presentation uh, to give you the steps. I'm not gonna go step-by-step -step through it. I'm just gonna highlight what each of these slides are and why it came about into that uh, capacity. Uh, this one is the default homepage would come up to the dashboard functionality. The problem with the dashboard is, is that uh, the customers do not uh, want their um, agents to actually go to smart to the dashboard immediately because they do a lot of work in the ticket yeah. console. And if you're familiar with going in the old ITSM mid-tier side of the house, 
uh, you got the, the ticket console that popped up on your uh, IT homepage or the uh, overview console. So we go back to displaying the tickets. The problem with switching over though, just to let you know, is if you do uh, any broadcasting, the broadcast actually show up in the dashboard for the agents using Smart IT. It does not pop up in a pop-up box like it does back in ITSM. So that's one thing that you would lose in that capacity. So changing it from dashboard to ticket console, you do get the advantage of going directly to that uh, option, <clears throat> but you do lose that functionality of uh, seeing the broadcast right away. The timeout functionality, there is two different settings that uh, is involved with this. By default, uh, the timeout is set to 30 minutes. So if you wanted to change it to longer to allow the agents to do more work or turn off, go to another app and come back in and they're still logged in, uh, you can go into the centralized configuration and set the session timeout from 30 to 90, as well as go into the uh, Tomcat and change the session timeout from 30 to 90 as well, and just go ahead and restart your Tomcat service. The Smart IT Ticket Console Open Ticket Display, um, basically when you're looking at the Ticket Console, it only shows you open tickets since created after 30 days. So this is a problem if you're keeping tickets open longer than 30 days, you lose the capability of seeing those tickets by default through that ticket console functionality. Uh, granted, you could create a filter and set it up to how long you wanna go, but that doesn't help the agents that are coming on board and you'd have to train them on that over and over again. So to change this, uh, this is one of the things we ran into. We have some several tickets that are still open since we started in uh, 20.02 and then it progressed to 2008. And so we had to change it to 180 days and then we have are gonna have to change it to 365 until those tickets that are still in pending status for incident and so forth are modified uh, to resolve status, then those tickets will go away and they won't be able to know that those tickets are there and then they'll stay in that assigned or in progress or pending state. So this is one thing that you may want to uh, consider in changing is setting it up to 180 days or maybe even 365, but keep on monitoring the performance of your uh, smart IT. Another issue that we encountered is uh, memory loss. The, smart, the agents tend to forget the naming conventions of all of your support groups that you've put out there. Um, generally, I always tend to put in the words uh, support or something common across on a group of the gr uh, group naming conventions to make this happen. However, in Smart IT, you only get a list of 80 that show up when you're looking for a group to assign it to, unless you know the name of the group. Well, not every uh, agent that's using Smart IT knows the name of the group. So we had to go in and change it. And Mike, this customer had 160 plus support groups. So I went ahead and changed the setting from the default of 80 to set it to 200. That way they can see all 200 of the groups that show up. Uh, when they're actually doing a search, they wouldn't have to remember every group name that's in the system itself. One of the things I encountered upgrading from 20.02 to 2008, and I have no reason or I have no valid uh, reason from BMC as to why they did this, but in testing out progressive web app functionality, we enabled it in our dev environment. We haven't moved it into production or in uh, QA yet. However, in our production environment, my customer noticed that the the activity log in Smart IT of when a ticket was reassigned to a support group was not getting flagged into the activity log. It was do getting flagged into it for individual reassignment or re individual assignment or status changes, but it wasn't getting it to a support group that was being reassigned to a ticket or being assigned to it. And since we can't see the audit log, we couldn't tell when that group got assigned to the ticket. So I started digging and I found this filter 
uh, as you can see in bold down at the bottom, it was updated with the upgrade to 20.08 with a run F qualification to state progressive view enabled is equal to true. So why do I care if it's enabled or not enabled if I wanted to know when a support group got changed or not changed? So what I did was I went ahead and fixed it by turning it to either an F or blank. So when I ran the log file, this field got set to empty if you did not have it turned on. So I went ahead and updated or modified the run of qualification with an overlay and provided it with this functionality. So that's something that I didn't pick up. It's not in my checklist uh, to look for anything that happens on an upgrade. This would have been perfect with Kai's uh, product to see the differences, to see what was added onto this. But uh, this kind of threw us off and now we are back in normal process of getting the activity log being updated when a support group changes, but not the individual changing that capacity. Okay. Another uh, issue that we encountered was creating work order templates. When I created a bunch of work order templates for a customer, not thinking about the smart IT viewing of the tickets, I did not assign the work order assignee because I'm not supposed to. That's the manager of the work order tickets. Well, when I put in the work order manager functionality, all those tickets were getting assigned, but nobody was getting, they were getting emailed, but they weren't seeing the tickets in the ticket console because the ticket console does not show work order manager by default. It shows the work order assignee. So we had to go back in and assign every one of our work order templates to whoever we put in as a work order manager. We also had to put them into as the work order assignee as well. Even though it wasn't required, we had to do that to make it to make those records show up. So just a word of the wise, the ticket console does not show work order manager tickets by default. You would have to get that set up and you also have to make sure your templates have the work order assignee populated. And if you are not utilizing a lot of the applications that you have in Smart IT to uh, when you click on that create new functionality, uh, you want to remove some of these things from the selection option capability. It doesn't affect Smart Recorder, but it does select that create new. You can hide some of these applications if you want to. Uh, this just shows you where you can disable service requests, work orders, change requests, problem investigation, and so forth. Uh, and you can have that those applications removed if you wanted to. Ones that you cannot uh, disable uh, are incident assets and knowledge because they're all tied to the person's permission to get access to Smart IT anyway. But they those you're not able to uh, disable anywhere along the lines as well. Um, these others that you can disable or enable if you wanted to is task, activity, and broadcast. That's just other functionalities that you cannot uh, disable or enable either way because they're part of the applications. They come in with the tabs uh, for task and activity and broadcasts are done when somebody actually submits or gains that permission uh, for broadcast submitter capability. So if you wanted to change it, just come over to your centralized configuration. And you can do this through the uh, Remedy AR Server Group uh, console as well. Go into the Smart IT setting. And then the Disabled Smart IT Applications and enter in the applications you want to remove. Any questions on that? Okay. So this is just verifying with those applications being removed by clicking on the create new. And we can see those items are gone. We also look at our filter option and we can see the filter options are also gone for work orders, uh, problem investigation, problem, uh, known errors and so forth. If you wanna enable, all you have to do is just come in and highlight the disable smart IT application and clear out the field and save it. And that'll put all the applications back in play. Another 20.08 thing that we ran into, and again, some of these are uh, catching you off guard. Um, when you're in the ticket console, you have your metric counter that shows up at the top along with the, um, the search results that you have. Well, with the out of the box default setting, the show ticket statistics button now shows up 
and that basically replaces the metric. So the agent would have to click on the button if they wanted to look at the metric itself. Me personally, I prefer the metric because I like to see the counters or count the tickets myself to see what they are. The metric does that for me. Plus if I wanted to go to the critical tickets, I could easily click on the critical option. So this was a change that uh, fit in my style as far as making sure that I go in and set the functionality of explicit stats refresh to um, from true to false and turn that functionality off. That way the show ticket stat statistics button does not appear. That takes care of just some of the highlights of smart IT that we've encountered and had to fix. <clears throat> now I'm gonna move into digital workplace. In the digital workplace, uh, changing the user's login ID functionality. Um, one of the things that we ran into was when we were changing them from all lowercase to uppercase, uh, er we encountered a lot of uh, DWP errors because their login ID did not get fixed or straightened out within that whole process. Uh, so some of the things we had to do was get help from BMC to convert all of our profiles, uh, logins from uppercase to lowercase. So they did all the transitioning from that uh, perspective. Another thing you could also do is go into the data wizard and convert those. If you're not using DWP or if you're using it, um, you can come through this aspect and change somebody's login ID if you wanted to. Uh, generally, this is just changing one or two individuals, not the whole crew from uppercase to lowercase. Now, when we did this also, we ran into a problem uh, with our bundled license. So what I'm getting at in this one is on the data wizard, if you're trying to convert somebody with a bundled license from a login ID of one thing to a login ID of something else, and you run that uh, into the system, it will break all of your um, group listings. It changes the group listings of everything as if the group went away and leaves you with the group ID number. So when we looked at the uh, selection of adding somebody into that license, like for example, incident um, submitter or incident user or incident master, we lost access to that. It didn't show up in our pick list after we ran one record to update to convert it because that person had a bundled license. Um, we went into the group list of that person's profile and everything that was flagged as incident user, uh, infrastructure change user, all of those were changed to a uh, five digit number, which is what their group ID number is instead of the group name. And if you're old school, you'll know that when you delete a group but don't take people out of that group, it leaves it in the group list with the group ID number. So BMC had to fix this functionality and then we did it again the second time. And that's when we realized this is what broke it. And it was with the utilization of the bundled license. So don't convert somebody's login ID in the data wizard if they have a bundled license. If they are no licenses or if they have a standard uh, fixed or floating but do not have a bundled, then you can run through this process and make the conversion into whatever they need to do. If they have a bundled license, what we did with their change is make sure we took a snapshot of what their um, application permissions and support groups were and then we ran them as a non-support person, converted them to a non-support that way we can get their login ID uh, to show up and remove it. And once we did that, after we removed that functionality, then we were able to put everything back in with the new login ID and them not losing their licenses or anything because then we had to re-add the license in that aspect. So make sure that you do not run the data wizard for anybody with a bundle license or you will break your back end uh, license structure of ITSM. The other issue that we encountered was the out of the box notification settings. The out of the box definition is email notifications, approvals, all of these notification mechanisms are by default turned off. The user would have to log in 
go into their preference, set it to start receiving emails. Now you try to tell that to 50 or 5,000 in users, that's a lot that you have to travel through. Well, we tried to uh, figure out how to do this. And the only way that you can do it is you have to wait until the person logs into DWP. That way it generates a preference for that person in DWP. And then you could run this SQL command, run this SQL command that would then convert all of your communications to turn it on. But again, it only affects those that have currently logged into DWP. If you have 4,000 that have not logged in, it's not gonna affect their preference because it's still not gonna create that notification. So you may have to schedule this to do this action at least once a week to make sure you catch any newbies that have their uh, data feed uh, turned off because they logged in for the first time. Okay, and this just shows you what to do if you have DWP 19 or 21, up to 2102, or if you have 1802. Moving into ITSM, just to wrap up on this one here, I think I'm still good on time. One of the things we just, we like to do is change the messages, the, the email templates, to provide it with a custom display, to provide it with whatever we need to do in that capacity. One of the things I found out in 2008, though, is that BMC has updated the attachment uh, criteria where in the attachment security where they flag the HTML and HTM extensions as being illegal. So when I try to remove an email template in the process and add it back in, it wouldn't let me add it in. I could delete it, but I couldn't add it in because of this restriction. So if you're on BMC Helix and you are not allowed to um, function as an administrator, you're gonna have to get BMC to go ahead and run this change for you, or you can make the change as well um, through the, the functionality here by just making the adjustment. So what I had to do on this case here is just go in and change the removal of that extension of HTML and HTML out of the attachment criteria restrictions. And then I was able to go ahead and add back in my HTML email template form. So that's one thing that came about is the upgrade of their restrictions is HTML and HTML is now one of those restricted piece, uh, pieces, okay? This next thing is something that we do at Partner IT as far as um, for our dev and QA environment. And because if you do not have administrator controls overall to reboot the email server or stop and start the server and then have to put in a ticket to get it started, with this custom form, and you could build your own custom form as well, we identify the in the ticket itself, to where we want anything that's going to the to designator, we want it to replace that field on the email message to whoever we want to send the notification to. So we disable all of our emails as they get generated to not send it out, but we still need to test our email functionality. So in this case, we have a filter that comes in, we set the send message to no, and we set the subject line of the to to match to whatever's in the ticket. And in that ticket designator, we would fill in the two or three or four email addresses that we wanna populate. Now, again, emails are getting pushed into the email message form. It's working fine, it's, a, it's good to go in that aspect. But now if we need to test something, all we have to do is go and find that email message we wanna test. We go ahead and see that our information in the message is set up with our two to go to the individuals that need to review it. We change our display advanced options from uh, no to yes, go to the message information tab, and we set the send message to yes. And when we do that, we save it within a minute, the email will go out and we get that message that comes across to us so we can test the format, the message that they're, they're gonna get, whatever we're doing in, an, in a QA and a dev environment and not have all these messages go out to everybody else. So it's just our way of not disabling the email server to have that go out. So it's a cute little trip, our, our 
feature that we have, a little trick to the trade. But we could also use this as a way for menus. I know you already have the sys uh, status menu, you have the sys menu items, but we have our own custom form that if we wanted, customers wanted a pick list of a menu listing for um, DWP advanced catalog or service request uh, catalog, we can give them a pick list by using the menu option as well, as long as we change the menu type from email to something else. So this allows us to run a lot of searches in that capacity so they can see the pick list from that uh, aspect. So this is just something that we use in that uh, format. Also as part of ITSM, um, when you're importing the bundled license using the data management tool, um, we, became, we caught, had that issue also of disabling our ITSM permission groups. So I don't know if BMC fixed this or not. They are aware of it. They knew that was going on. But when we had this back at the end of last year, uh, this also broke our permission setting. And so they had to fix all of this. So we could not go in and do anything with our importing of bundles. So we imported everybody with the fixed license. And then we went back and re uh, modified theirs manually to give them a bundled license capability. Another thing in ITSM is the data management jobs, the DMT jobs. Based on who created these jobs, the completed functionality is set based on your application preference setting under the data management tab. Uh, by default, I think it's 30 days. If you, or 180 days, I'd have to go back and look. I'm pretty sure it's 30 days. Um, in that capacity. But if you go into your own application preference setting, in this case, you can see I have set mine to seven days. So in this one, whenever you create that and it's completed or it's errored or whatever, those jobs do not stay in the system for any longer than seven days. That gives us enough time to troubleshoot. It also gives us enough time to make sure that everything's working fine if we need to from that capacity. So if you wanted to get rid of your DMT job uh, records that are completed, canceled, um, or errored out, then consider changing whoever created those jobs and setting their data management uh, tab setting of their application preference. And this next one, I'm not going to get into it. I'm just going to let you know that if you've never generated a rule base uh, functionality for somebody to create a ticket using the email operation. This will let show you how you can create an RBE process using an email to create a ticket and incident with an incident template being picked up. So it's again, the same rules on that, what you're creating, what you're setting up. We're creating this functionality for termination. I put in the qualification that has to be in the subject line. If it derives uh, anything other than that, it will not use this RBE rule. And then under the actions, I put into the optional field, the template that I wanna pick up into this whole process. So this is just showing you how you can set up your RBE functionality to create tickets using your email functionality. And then another thing that caught me off guard, uh, this was even in uh, 2002 or 2002, was BMC changed the field of is virtual from BMC underscore computer system to BMC underscore system. Um, that way, that field could be used by application, application system, um, and the other classes that are underneath the system. They flag the computer system field as is virtual underscore old. As you can see here, it's showing you old as the original field in the computer system uh, designator. I ran into this when I was trying to do some workflow with that field designator, and it said that field didn't exist, and it was correct. It did not exist at that point in time. Finally, just to wrap this up, uh, one of my checklist items I go into now on BMC Helix is to check the UDM colon job log form. Um, when I checked that functionality, all of a sudden in our production environment, there were four different integration attempts being made through our Helix environment, and we didn't know it. 
And I came across this and I'm like, well, it failed because we didn't have those custom forms. We didn't have SCCM. Uh, we were playing around with it in our dev, but not in our production. So then I put in a BMC ticket into the system and they said, oh, okay, we know what we need to do to fix it. They stopped two of them and then they stopped the other two. They didn't know why the other two were running, but they never told me what caused it. So just to let you know, they may in BMC Helix route things into your environment by accident, but I still would check UDM job log, even if you're on-prem, just to make sure if you have anything that failed, this would tell you if there's any attempts to try to put data in through an integration piece and if it failed in that capacity. So again, this just gives you a wrap up on some of the things we've encountered. Um, gives you the steps on what we did to fix them, how we added them into the process. Um, there are other things we've encountered. I did not put that in here because of the time period itself, but I will update this, like I said before, for the December uh, 7th to the 9th, Las Vegas Road. Is there any questions at all? I guess I should look at the chat, see if there's anything in the chat. Yeah, Lenny, several things have gone into the chat, but I think most of them were just discussions around the different pieces that you were covering. Okay. And weren't necessarily questions directly to you for it. Okay. So was, the, I guess my only question to everybody here is, was this presentation helpful? Was it refresher? Was it useless? Found it very helpful on my end here, uh, Lenny. Thank you. Uh huh. Yeah, I definitely appreciate knowing about some of those gotchas you explained. I found it useful too. I have a question. Uh, um, a long time ago, I've not pl played around with Smart IT in the uh, with the recent versions, but uh, one of the earliest version, I'd noticed that the uh, the list of uh, tickets that would appear in the console on and on either smart ID or my ID, I don't remember clearly, did not sync with the tickets that appeared in the console in the mid-tier. Have you found out uh, where, like, you know, that query is uh, conf configured that throws the, the, the tickets to the console at uh, smart ID so you can reconfigure that to, to make that both in sync if it's still a problem? Um, that I have not. Um... I can find out for you. If you send me the question, I'll dig up and, and find out, then we can post it to all the email addresses on here, unless sure. somebody else knows about it. Sure, um, uh, specifically, it was with the change tickets. And if I'm not mistaken, the uh, the tickets that would not appear in Smart IT were the ones that were in draft. So I, I did not see any reason why that might have been purposely left out. I, I have a feeling it was an oversight and not like you know something that uh, BMC left left out on, on purpose. You didn't put in a BMC support ticket on it, did you? I did at that time when I was working with that customer, but my project ended ended before like you know that ticket was. So I don't I don't know what the resolution to that was. Okay, I'll see if I can research for you and I'll uh, post it on here and have um, Bob or Phil send it out to everybody that's on this. Yeah, um, um, uh, like. I'm about to set up a system on my, my end as well, so I'll, I'll have a look at that myself. And if I find out anything, I'll, I'll share it with you guys. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Yep. Anybody else? So, Lenny, um, what I found helpful in here was the piece you were talking about with the is virtual. Um, I've run into a recent issue trying to uh, disable a reconciliation job. And I mean, that's all I'm doing is just changing it to not active. And it throws up an error about the is virtual field. Uh, I have not logged it with BMC yet, uh, trying to figure out how to capture some of the information before I do kind of thing. But that may be a scenario that's going on that this job has been around for us for uh, several years. And it probably was, it was created before that event happened that you're talking about. And that may be what's causing the error to happen when we do it. So that's, you gave me something else to go look at there that wasn't even related to what you were 
uh, directly pointing out. So I appreciate that. Yeah, change, try changing it to underscore old. You'll get the old field. So whatever values were in that field should still be the same. Yeah, what's, but, what's interesting is it's the recon job itself just disabling. And we don't even use the is virtual anywhere in the recon job, but it's still throwing the error. Right. So, so uh, it's probably a thing I'm going to have to delete the job completely, not just uh, disable it get rid of it but that, well keep in mind the is virtual is part of the reconciliation um precedence yeah. search so so you may have to change that right so anyway that, okay. that, they gave me something else to look at there appreciate it okay well i like to find the got well i hate to find the gotchas but i like to <laughs> share those gotchas so if anybody else has any gotchas that they would like to uh, bring up by all means. If you wanna make a presentation at the RUG uh, conference here or at Las Vegas, by all means, uh, set it up. And uh, you could do something like this, things that you've encountered while you're running in it. Or if you have an issue and you would like to discuss it, bring that up as well. And we can bring that into a discussion session on how to fix it or things like those, okay? All right. So did you want to take a break, Bob, and for five minutes, then come back since I'm doing the next one? Uh, sure. I, I guess everybody could have a, a, a five minute uh, break right here if you want. Um, so we'll, we'll come back in five minutes and uh, Lenny will proceed with uh, adding fields to the Smart IT uh, console and forms. Okay. Hey, Lenny. Yes. Yeah, this is Phil. So I, I finished my other call. Uh, I wanted to let you know that Jason and I, uh, Jason Miller and I, and uh, some other folks on the Gunnison team, we've been talking about some of our CMDB struggles and integration struggles and, you know, uh, the Pentaho things and, and things we've done. Jason's done a bunch of really cool things. You know, we're talking about the lack of the birds of the feather uh, sessions that we typically have. And, um, you know, it might be fun. And again, when we're in Vegas to uh, maybe even have a CMDB panel, but I think I'm going to try to get together with Jason and, and uh, some of the other folks to have kind of a, uh, you know, a CMDB support group, if you will, <laughs> to kind of talk about some of these, because there are a lot of people that are doing some very interesting things and overcoming some very interesting challenges uh, that, you know, that, that we're experiencing. So I'm looking forward to seeing you in Vegas. I'm looking forward to being there in Vegas. Uh, and Anders, yeah, definitely uh, love to have you there. And, and you know, let's, uh, uh, if you can make it, I think it'd be a great thing. And again, we're going to also have a virtual ability. I, I'm sorry, I joined late. So uh, pardon my, uh, my catch up here on this, but I'm looking forward to that. Looking forward to seeing you guys. Um, but I may reach out to somebody, uh, you know, I, I may reach out to this group and see if anybody wants to have a, uh, uh, a um, you know, a, a CMDB type discussion before we get there. Anders says he already booked a flight. How come you're not flying yourself? Aren't you already a pilot? I think Anders is a pilot. I don't know if your little 172 can make it across the pond. But uh, anyway, yeah, that can thanks. be tricky. With that, I, <laughs> with that, I yield back. Oh, and by the way, I wanted to ask you, Lenny and Bob, because every time I talk to you guys, you guys tell me, well, I found something for BMC and they're looking at it. My question to you and Bob is how much are, is BMC paying you for their support, by the way? so Not nearly enough. <laughs> <laughs> well that's the value of having you know you guys and and i know dan dan nichols a lot of his folks you know uh kate and everybody you know a lot of us are on uh you know these beta programs and things so you know that really helps him out a lot so uh it, it's kind of in jest really but i mean you know you we we find a lot of things that i think are are, uh, are critical that goes into this you know this product set that we use so um i'll, I'll give you guys a break from listening to me but yeah um, bob yeah. lenny uh, I, I appreciate you guys taking this, Barb, and, and for doing this, and Kais also for presenting. Thank you, everybody. And Phil? Yes, sir. What it's worth, BMC is paying me for my... <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're one of those special cases. <laughs> so, oh, so, I've, called, I've been called special more than once in my life. So, so, Lenny, I think that means LJ's buying you and me at least a beer, if not a steak dinner, because he's getting all the money for what we do to help BMC. No, they're not paying me to pay you. <laughs>
Well, if it's under twenty-five dollars, then then he can uh, you know put it on the expense report. Uh, <laughs> but uh, and and by the way, you know, for those of you who don't know, Lenny says beer, it's really rum and coke. Anyway, back to that. I see Victoria uh, wants to say something. I think it should be in and out burger. He should have to pay you when we go to Vegas. They have one there? They have three there. As long as we can walk to it, that'd be great. And by the way, I, you know, uh, Victoria also, uh, you know, her and her team, they're very involved in, in the beta program. I know that, you know, she sends out uh, emails to all of us to, to join the beta program. So, you know, again, it, this, is, this is our community, if you will. So thank you, Victoria. You're welcome. Okay, so we're going to take a five-minute break and then come back at 12.15, my time, I guess. It's five minutes from whatever your time is. Yeah. We'll be back in. Yep, 15 after the hour. Okay. Sure, thanks. Hey, Lenny, I want to know, uh, I want to know how many uh, professional athletes are running around without their shirts on uh, based upon what I see from behind you. Oh, because of the jerseys? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I did not get them from off their backs, my young man. I had to pay <laughs> quite a few pennies for those. Well, some of them. <laughs> I mean, one that you don't see is the Dick Buckus jersey and that that cost me 350 bucks to get that assigned autograph football and a, and a photo. It's probably wow. the most expensive one I have. Oh, a shirt that you stole right off their backs would have been probably worth a lot more. Uh, true. <laughs> but then I would have been in jail too. So. <laughs> You won't find me on YouTube there, Phil, stealing somebody's shirt. And, and running away with it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Naked on the field. <laughs> they remembered Brady's uh, jersey from, from the Super Bowl a couple of years ago, didn't they? Yeah, he eventually got it back from what I heard. So did you give OJ back his stuff? And, uh, I don't have anything from him. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when he found somebody, he, he went to, to Vegas and found somebody buying some of his stuff and he, and he busted in and stole it back or something. There was some article about that. I remember years ago. He yeah. Well, that's why, that. yeah, that's why he was in jail. I think he spent more time uh, in jail for that than uh, he did the whole uh, Nicole thing, didn't he? Yep. Not that he was guilty of the whole Nicole thing. Well, the glove wouldn't fit because he had a glove on. Then he tried to fit a tight glove over top of a glove. Yeah, I read the uh, Marsha Clark book, and she laid out all the evidence, and they just didn't present it right. But that's for historians to deal with. But were you guys the ones that sat there and watched the car chase for I don't know how many hours that was on TV? I did not. Definitely did not. <laughs> Me neither. But I have friends who that's what they did. They sat there all day or whatever and watched the car chase. I'm like, really? Can you call it a chase when the speed of it is like 10 miles an hour? <laughs> Isn't that like a parade, not a chase? Well, especially when you had, what, 15, 20 cop cars and motorcycles trailing them? Yeah, it did look like a parade. Yeah, all for nothing. So, Anders, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see you on. And, and uh, 
you know, I think Bob and Lenny did their best to try to schedule this so it wasn't in the middle of the night for you guys. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that eases your your burden there a little bit. We've got a bunch of other people also from uh, uh, from Europe and, and different places. So I'm glad to see those uh, those folks on this time. I think we got a lot more this time because we changed the uh, the time. And and we are recording this. I guess Bob said he's recording it. We Excellent. do have my buddy. We do have my buddy from India that's on here too. So he, he's in the middle over. He's past midnight. And Lenny, and I was working um, Smart IT PE um, for a better part of a year, um, and I worked the back end calls on some of those uh, some of those uh, performance things that you were mentioning regarding you know limit limit this the number of returns on this call and such. And uh, I'd say probably 90% of the ones that you mentioned, I had worked PE calls on. And uh, I can say definitively that those were uh, added to limit the amount of time the database was spending performing queries right. in customers that didn't do good data maintenance in their systems. Well, I, I get it, but it's sometimes it's a shock when you don't see the change. Like on DWP now, you have that uh, show more where before it used to give you all the values. Now you, it only gives you a small number. And then you, if you wanted to see all of it, you have to click a button. So instead of making it easier from not having a click two times, you, uh, you only had the one click, now you have two clicks. So those are the kind of surprises that show up that uh, customers weren't used to seeing. I get the understanding of it. So because of performance, you don't need to see it all if you see your choice right there. But if you need to see all of them, they have to click on show more. So, yeah. so those it, those kind of things become a nuisance for some customers. So yeah, it, it's it's a fine edge to watch to walk when you've got customers with you know 200 million uh, incidents in their incident form, and they're expecting to be able to return queries in less than two seconds. Oh yeah. It's like um. Let's give them an option that allows them to do that. <laughs> okay, are we ready to get started again? It's yeah, I think we are, Lenny. Let's uh, start with your adding fields to Smart IT Ticket Console and Forms. Okay, I promise that this is going to be less of me talking. Uh, so I will talk a little slower, but I will not use up the full 30 minutes. So... Uh, we can leave open for time for discussions if somebody wants to bring up a topic or we can just end the conference uh, call earlier. But I thought maybe throwing in for some of you that don't know how to do this is to how do you add an out of the box or custom field to not only a form, but also to a ticket console. Keep in mind, I'm talking about non-progressive web app for the forms. Um, this is before you do that, because once you turn on progressive web apps, you lose the capability of the form menu uh, functionality that you could control that there, because you're now doing it into the, the developer studio. So this one is uh, the customer wanted to have a three element location designator to reference the location of the individual. It's a lot easier, that's what they're used to. So we came up with the mail stop on the CTM people form to represent the three element site location data. So this information we had to go in and find out what the property of it was, the field ID number, uh, everything else within the Dev Studio. So we, we took that off of the CTM people form. And then we had to populate that information into the SHR union underscore data source underscore fields form. So when you, there is a video on this, there is a YouTube that goes into walking you through all of this functionality. I followed that YouTube video and I just could not get the field to show up. I mean, what am I not doing? What am I, why isn't it showing up in the ticket console? And then I realized I left the data tag at the bottom blank. <clears throat> when you look at the YouTube video, they left the data tag field blank. And so 
I went in, added in, and if, of course it showed up in that uh, capacity. So in this case, I put in the union field name of mail station in all capital letters. I marked it as enabled to go in on the smart IT ticket console. So it would actually show up in that capacity. Then in the SHR union underscore data source underscore field mapping, I created a record for the same field reference using again, the same data tag. It was not again in the video uh, populated in that capacity. So I had to add a record to reference that field from which form that the data is going into. So you have the mail station that's also on the incident form, the HPD help desk. So we brought that in as well. Same field ID number, same field, everything. Then we took that information and made sure that we added into the share under, uh, union underscore configuration console form. So we basically returned the object list uh, console and located this form. We opened it up, set, I set the implementation area to smart IT ticket console up at the top, validated the mail station showed up there from the two forms that we created the record on. Okay, then I went ahead and clicked on the build, rebuild database union structure button, and then selected the okay to the message. The functionality then said to go back to the dev studio, uh, to the SMT union smart IT underscore ticket console form and add that field to your this form. Well, the YouTube says copied and pasted. I tried to copy and paste it and wouldn't let me do it. So I was able to basically create a brand new one. Once I created the brand new one, then of course it started showing up in the pop-up uh, functionality. So again, grain of salt, whatever you wanna do. YouTube video was helpful, don't get me wrong. It's just, I, it just left off uh, one thing and told me to do something else and it just not, did not work. So you have to go back to Dev Studio and update the SMT Union Smart IT Ticket Console form. So here's where I added that into the form and I changed the label from main station to what the customer is used to seeing, which is TLA site and save that functionality. <clears throat> I went back to the SHR union configuration console form, clicked on the rebuild button again, select on okay on the message to make sure that the changes were displayed as well. Then when I went into Smart IT, I accessed the Smart IT uh, to verify the additional field was there. I clicked on the three dots. It popped up on the three dots to show the functionality in TLA site. But I also had to click on the refresh metadata. So that would also make sure that it refreshed it because I was logged in. Uh, already. If you weren't logged into Smart IT, you wouldn't normally have to do it. If you don't see the field after you made all those initial changes, go ahead and click on the refresh metadata so it shows. And then you can see that your TLA site would show up on the left hand side. And all you have to do is drag it over to your visible console. And then it displays in your ticket console designator. If you wanted it to show up in your preset, just edit your preset and add the field to it as there. Now, while I'm here, one of the things that we discovered as well, and I put in a ticket to BMC on this, is your columns um, have a minimum size requirement. It is hard coded in Smart IT, so you cannot change that with a parameter. For example, if you look at, <clears throat> excuse me, the TLA site that we have, it's only three letters, and there's a lot of space in that capacity. Sorry about that. So we tried to shrink it and it wouldn't go any far smaller than what you're seeing on the screen. So the customer wanted it smaller so you can move some things around. So if it is a smaller label and things like that, we would like to expand our ticket console to bring in fields into the view of our console. Well, it's hard coded. There is no parameter. So you're stuck right now with the minimum requirement of the column. So you cannot adjust it to one character, two characters, or anything like that. So I just wanted to point that out since I was here. So that is the step-by-step -step process, very short and simple on how you can add it to the ticket console. You have several forms that are involved that you have to create a ticket in. There's a form in Dev Studio that you have to update with the new 
attribute that you want to include into that process, and then you display that functionality into the system. And then just to refresh on the adding an attribute to a specific application view, again, this is pre-progressive web apps. If you're adding a custom field to whatever form designator, these are the forms that you need to add them into. Uh, for example, if you're doing it in work order, you have to make sure that the field in, is in the WI work order form, as well as the WI work order interface create form. Uh, same thing for incident, HPD will help desk, but it has to go into not only the HPD interface, incident interface create. Uh, I always include it in the HPD inter incident interface form, as well as the HR, SHR union overview master console. And then of course, add it to the sys status reason menu if it's gonna be affecting the status reason designator. So going into the forms, making the necessary form changes, once you do that, then you come into the incident view after you refresh the metadata, uh, meta cache. Then you can go ahead and click into the header section where your field is expected to go into. And in this case, this is our mail station that was not visible. So we open up the mail station, we hid the label so the label doesn't show, they just get the, the value if there is a value that displays. And then whenever they look at the ticket, they can see LAK is the abbreviation above the site designator. Hey, Lenny, uh, let me ask a question real quick, if you don't mind. Sure. We're having an issue with one of our customers and they have uh, a customization that um, they have what they call local VIP and enterprise VIP. And we're trying to get them onto a uh, smart IT and they want to display that, that customization. Is this... Would we be able to do that and show that on a form and show that on a ticket to to show, walk through what you just did to add the local and the EVIP? Because all Remedy, as we know, is VIP, right? Right. And we like to uh, designate them as an enterprise. It's uh, 06 or above and a local VIP. It has the same uh, thing, but it's for a specific region or specific base post station. I take it this field is in both the HPD help desk and in the CTM people? Uh, I probably have to ask Deb if she uh, knows about that, uh, but I think so. Okay, then the answer would be yes. If you only have it in CTM people, then you can only show it in the CTM view, people view. You wouldn't be able to show it on the incident ticket. So it has to be in both with the and same field ID. Add it into the incident ticket view? Yeah, you could add it in as long as it's on the HPD help desk form. Deb Rive, are you on the line? I, th I thought I saw your name in there. Are you there? Um, yes, it, it is on both. However, what they really want is to have a visual icon like they do for the VIP. So they want it as a checkbox to say that they're local? Or? No. Well, on, on the uh, VIP, you get this little icon that comes up that's very clear. It's a VIP indicator. They want the same type of thing to happen with their custom form for local VIPs. They're going to be flagged in the people record as not a VIP, but they are going to be flagged as a local VIP for their local area. And you're not using progressive web apps, correct? No, no. Well, why could you add it in and hide the label? And then if the value is, is displayed in there as far as local, it'll show up that way? Well, and if it it's is blank, displayed. It yeah, we, we've got it so that it actually displays the word LVIP. However, it's just a word and it's not an indicator like the icon for VIP. Right. And they want the icon. The only thing I can tell you is you'll have to wait till progressive web apps unless somebody else has another okay. option. But um, you could get it done on PW on PWA. But I don't know if you can do it without the PWA capability with the icon. Lenny, are you able to add buttons with images into Smart IT using the same process? Not without PWA. Okay. Yeah. Hey, th thanks, Deb. I didn't realize you guys got uh, that much further because that was a question over here. So it sounds like you got to work around and got a little bit further. But I saw this and it just made me think of that uh, issue on Smart IT. But thanks, Lenny. This yes. Is, this 
Yeah, the yeah, the, the K-Dubs, K-Dubs who demoed it, and they liked that the LVIP showed up as a word, but they wanted an icon, so it was a visual. They're not looking for a word. Right. The only other way would be to do a uh, action and have them click on it from the more option to see additional details about the person, but they're not going to like that. They don't want to go to a custom form that shows the icons there. I mean, that's the only way if you want an icon that I know of, but I can't think of anything that you could do without progressive web apps. Um, LJ, are you still on? Yeah, I was, I was trying to rack my brain about how to get this done. Um, and and I, I agree with you that it looks like it's probably, you know, once, once you go PWA, obviously you're just uh, dealing with, you know, a mid-tier display at that point and you can do whatever the heck you want. Um, but within the smart IT structure, um, the only way you'd be able to do something like that is if you modified the, uh, if, if you modified the Angular code. Okay. You know, and we are that, going they aren't going to allow us to do that. So yeah, it, it's not a customization that is capable. It is it is something that is you know the, the VIP code is you know custom coded by BMC and it's not something that you have the capability of doing yourself. Okay. So, All right. Now and our problem is is of course they aren't going to be ready for any type of containerization anytime soon. So we aren't going to be able to get to progressive views and form. So we're going, sort of stuck at 2002 for for the time being. Yeah, you know, and I think a lot of other people are in that situation. Could they change the cascade style sheet though? <clears throat> Is that a possibility? Dev? I know, I know I can't do it because it's Helix and BMC controls that. Deb? That's a question for LJ, not me. <laughs> well, no, what, what, what he's saying is that, um, you know, you, you, and that's part of the customization I was talking about. If, if you're able to, modify the files that are displaying what's on the you know the the mid-tier the, the client files are just um they're, they're very similar to javascript it's just a different javascript um so if, if you're willing to modify that stuff on your installation it completely breaks your upgradeability but it gives you what you want then the answer would be no we, we can't right. break <laughs> <laughs> That is I mean, true. on my custom forms, <laughs> on my custom forms, I can change all the CSS I want right in my forms, and that's not a big deal. But it's not across the board, right? Yeah, it's it's like in the old days of updating the um, the custom core JS file in mid tier. You can do it, <laughs> mm-hmm. but it broke. You know, when you upgrade, you have to remake your change, or you lose your change. Um, so the, the, cl- the smart IT client, you have the ability to modify all sorts of stuff that are not supported by BMC to modify. But if you're stuck at 21, if you're stuck, stuck at 2008 and, uh, you know, the next upgrade you're doing is going to be containerization, then, um, you're not going to be making those changes in the next version anyway, and you're going to be moving to PWA. So that quasi mitigates the upgrade concerns. <laughs> so puts you in an interesting position. Yeah. And yeah, I think they're going to have to wait. On the note of uh, containerization, Phil mentioned the CMDB support group. We might need to start a uh, container support group too, because I think um, yeah. most people are going to have a challenge with that. I've started to see some of the specs. Uh, that BMC recommends for a non-prod environment. And it was fairly considerable. So while the containers themselves might take less resources, your infrastructure needs to be a bit bigger just to manage the containers. Nice. I don't think customers are going to be ready for that. Since you brought that up, Jason, um, how about throwing this out? Does everybody feel comfortable going on Facebook and having a Facebook group? Uh, limited to whoever wants to get into the group itself to have a container group as well as a CMDB group to post whatever they find out or what they want to do. I know we already have BMC communities, but there's so much information in BMC communities. Do we want to have a centralized um, Facebook group or some other social media group that we can do our discussions on? 
you know, Phil and I laughed about that yesterday that, you know, we're, we're kind of kicking around the idea of we're almost reinventing the ARS list, a smaller yes. group of right. people who care. <laughs> um, so wherever that happens, I'm open to it. But yeah, I, I think we definitely could use something like that. Yeah, I, I would uh, agree on this end as well. I, I think we're open to it. We're actually probably three weeks away from ha having our container environment set up in our uh, uh, demo lab. Uh, we're working on that right now. So I would definitely love to share what we're finding on our end and cool. talk to you guys, see what's going on on your end. But we got a, uh, a private cloud hosted environment that we're getting set up with containers right now. Fantastic. Well, I have a... Well, um presentation on progressive web app that I found, but I have to upgrade my environment from 1908 uh, tools to start playing around with progressive web app to 20.08. But uh, there's a lot of changes once you do switch it over that it's going to be an eye-opening change for your smart IT agents, uh, the way that they view it now and when they view it with the progressive web app. Uh, uh, I haven't, I haven't a positive or it's going to be a negative or is it just going to be one of those cultural change things that they have to get used to? Um, I would say it's a cultural change. I mean, uh, one of the things when you do a search for, or when you email an incident, for example, it defaults with only send an email. And this is what threw me off. Which means to the customer, the contact, or the incident assignee, incident owner, individual. So that left you to only four people. I'm like, why can't they send it to somebody else? Yeah. So now I have to uncheck that box to get everybody else in the system. And again, I get it now because it's a performance thing, but I usually send it to somebody else. I don't send it to the customer for the most part. So so that's one of the things that was an eye opener for me is on an email incident was that was a big change. So, but uh, there's a few others. I'm still playing around with, but I need to get into containers myself. All right. Well, I'll, I'll see if I'll work with Phil and, and Bob on setting up a Facebook uh, discussion and we could do it as a combination instead of having multiple groups, just have one group and we could probably call it the, uh, I don't know if you want to call it BMC remedy V rug or, but maybe something like remedy V rug. I don't hey Lenny, can I ask you one more, one more question about the custom field? Uh-huh. The can you does that affect the filters in the ticket console? Adding in the filter itself, the field you, it's yeah, if you add that custom field in, does it does it does it add no to the to the filter or do you have to do that in a separate step? Um you know what? I've never added a field to anybody add a field to the filter because I haven't. But it doesn't affect, it doesn't show up. Okay. Hey, Lenny, I, I was, I was going to add, too, to the, the customizations of the, the CSS. So this is Kevin Schaefer. We, uh, we have a customer that uh, we did modify the CSS file with the assistance of BMC support, and BMC mm. support did say they would support it for upgrades. So you have that. I know, LJ, mm. you, you mentioned it wouldn't, but uh, I don't know what the message is here. But uh, we, we had a requirement, and I recognize a lot of names out here. I have DOD customers and uh, commercial. This was for a DOD. Uh, the requirement was that they wanted to require change templates uh, to be used on the change, and they wanted it from Smart IT. Um, and uh, so we modified the Smart Recorder screen down there at the bottom, and we modified the text to, to be read. Uh, down there at the bottom. And so the CSS file was modified. So um, I know it's possible and BMC is the one that helped us through the branding of that. So I, I, it goes back to the VIP logo. I, I don't know uh, if, if there is something that can be done there, but it might be worth opening a ticket just to see. It might just be who you get a hold of. Yeah, my, my, my statement of unsupported is uh, general, and this is a general statement across the board about BMC. If it is a file that's laid down by the installer, then your customization of it generally is not a supported customization. Anything that BMC wants you to be able to customize is going to be something that's going to be configured in the 
you know, centralized configuration screens or something along those lines, like the, like the limits um, on how many records are returned type thing. Um, so yes, obviously there, there's exceptions to every rule, but generally speaking, if it's a file on the file system, um, if modifying it is the solution to your problem, the next time you run the install, the installer is going to lay down the out of the box file and your changes aren't going to be in there. So it's not generally considered a supported change. And that's just a general rule. Obviously, there's exceptions to everything. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to turn it over to you, Bob. All right, Lenny, uh, if you'll stop presenting, that'll hand it back where I can do. And... All right, and so I get the uh, last presentation today, which is preserving custom fields during an upgrade when the overlays fail you. Um, this has to do with um, trying to, with, with our customer, they wanted us to do as few modifications to out of the box as possible. And, uh, but of course there's always custom fields you need and so forth with it. And even uh, in, in, we started at version 7604 and we have upgraded basically every upgrade since to get to 2002 uh, at this point. And so there have been a lot of points and times where things behind the scenes, I'm going to say out of the box changed and the overlays being there it went with what we had in an overlay uh, in preference over what was uh, changed out of the box underneath. Okay. Um, again, the problem here is that BMC upgrades focus on upgrading the base layer for it. Uh, everything you've got is an overlay and a customizations uh, or, or in the overlay. And like I said, too many times I've seen where changes at the base layer uh, did not come back and reflect in that view overlay. Uh, one of our, one example that we had is, uh, I think it was uh, going to 9102 or maybe it was after 9102. Um, on the change form, they uh, were, were presented the tasks that were related to the change. The table uh, was now pointing to a completely different join form than it used to present to. But when we did the upgrade, it kept the original join form table there for us because we had added a column into that table at one point in time. So our overlay uh, stayed up there and we started seeing uh, in our test environment, we started seeing as we built new change requests, we weren't seeing the tasks because they weren't writing into that old join uh, that it used to, it was writing in to the new join. And so uh, we had to, you know, spotting that allowed us to uh, uh, realize that we had an issue for it. So one of the things that uh, I've done in our system is I have worked very hard hard to try not to modify directly on top of the out of the box pieces. Yes, you'll see here, I've got one or two things that do show up, but the main thing I tried to do was to put them on a custom tab uh, off to the side uh, for it and put all of my fields that I needed over there in that custom tab. And what that did for me uh, is now I could come into a, a process here during my upgrade and I can work to try to get all of that back quickly and, uh, and easily instead of having to get into one field at a time. So one of the things we do that I do with it is I take whatever view I have in the overlay and I'm showing here the, the example you see down in the bottom portion of your dev studio, it, it puts a little blue icon to let you know that's in an overlay and I'm taking the best practice view here and I'm saying I want to duplicate that view. That way I preserve every field I've added to that view 
by copying it off into a, uh, another view for temporary purpose. Okay, and then I, I give that uh, new view a label for what I'm trying to do. And then one of the things you've got to make sure you do is do a save. If you don't do the save when you duplicate that view, and then you go try to blow away the overlay part of the view, you'll lose all that customization that stuff. It, 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 it'll just eliminate all the fields uh, that you just added to that view when you do it. So you want to go ahead and save that immediately. And then you come back and it's, you go back to this view and you say delete view. And like I say, this is the scary part because it doesn't say delete view overlay, as we all know, look at this stuff. It just says delete view. And you got to make sure you're on a view that isn't an overlay. And then, then it'll pop up a little dialogue and say, hey, this overlay will be deleted. Are you sure, sure you want to do that? And then you have to save it again so that the, you see the little blue icon went away after saving it down here to, to say this view is no longer in the overlay, it's out of the box uh, for it. So then what you wanna do is come back in and add the, your customizations back to the overlay and create an overlay for that view. So you get on that view and highlight it and you say add field to the view overlay. And you pick out of the best practice view, the, the one that I copied and I just picked the, the, uh, the tab itself. And I picked down in here into the uh, ellipse to what views it's defined in. And I add the best practice view over. And it says, you know, do you, to, to do this, do you The, and so when I do that with the tab, all of my fields automatically return as well. I don't have to go field by field, bringing them into the view overlay, just bringing in that tab brings all of them back. So the, you know, that's one of my main recommendations. If you're gonna do custom fields, put them on a custom tab and bring the tab back. Uh, it'll bring all your fields back automatically with you when you do that. And uh, like I said, this, this is just a quick, simple piece. This is, uh, uh, allows you to keep your customizations and your data. So, you, I mean, that's, that's a big piece is you've got custom fields. If you accidentally delete the fields, you lose the data. Uh, and the processing time by doing it with the tab and bringing it over is, is, is so fast with it. Uh, we have basically done every one of those upgrades uh, to our production environment uh, in a matter of two to three days. When, back in the early days when it, when it take a long time to uh, process the out of the box pieces. But now we're knocking out uh, upgrades within a matter of about six hours on our production environment. Uh, and this is still one of the uh, ways that I handle our customizations. And any questions for that? Hey, Bob. Yeah. This is Phil. Yeah. Uh, when when you want, when you first showed this to me, and I encourage you to pr to present this. By the way, I appreciate you doing this. One of the questions I had that some other folks may have is when I've added, you know, uh, copied and pasted, you know, custom fields from form to form, it gives me the zero zero x y coordinates. And what you showed, and what I want to make clear is the fact that this preserves the positioning for these, right? So you, you yes. have to go back and, and drag them all out and put them in, you know, and align them and, and move them over. So this preserves the, 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 the XY positioning of these. Yeah, but by having them in that, in that tab and bringing that whole tab back, all that XY position comes back, all the fields on the tab come back, all of that uh, stays intact. When you have a field that you're having to bring back that's, uh, you know, and I, and I just kind of showed up there that, yeah, I do have a few that end up on top of the uh, out of the box uh, pieces over there. When I bring those back, I run into that same issue you're talking about. It sticks them at zero, zero. I got to go figure out and put it where I want it to go again and that kind of stuff. But the ones I'm able to do in those tabs and just bring the tab back, 
yeah, all of that X, Y coordinate positioning and everything stays the same. All of the fields on that tab come back with it. I don't have to pick, you know, there were multiple fields you saw on that tab. Uh, I'll go back to it real quick um, on there. there. There's actually fields that are uh, with no label that just present that are laying on here next to every one of these fields. Uh, uh, it's, it's sort of the uh, question answer kind of concept that we piece together here. So there's uh, 30 plus fields on this. And like I said, if, if you had the scenario of having to bring them back one at a time and worry about the X, Y position on them, that could take a very long time to, uh, to bring them back into the view. But by having them on that custom tab, they all just come right back exactly where you want them. I don't know if that'll help anybody or um, maybe everybody already knows this and I'm, you know, I, I figured it out as well, but I don't know. Bob, I'm, I'm going to say that probably not everybody knows this because I know that BMC called you up and questioned you and said, how did you actually get this upgrade completed without our help in six hours? And I think they wanted to know how you did this. So yeah. I would doubt that everyone knows this, but thank you for sharing this. Yep. Yeah, BMC was caught off guard with uh, several of our upgrades that we didn't even call them for support during the upgrade. So... All right. Um, again, a reminder, I'll go back to over here for a minute to remind the next VRUG date again. Save the date is August 26 at 5 p.m. Central. We do need uh, presenters and topics. Uh, I don't, I, I, I enjoy presenting, but y'all are going to get tired of hearing me present every time. You'll get tired of hearing Phil and Lenny every single time. Well, maybe not, maybe not Lenny. We enjoy hearing Lenny. <laughs> but uh, uh, some of the rest of you, I'm sure y'all have got some cool things that you've uh, done that you want to show or little tips, even like what I just did kind of stuff. Uh, just let us know, um, send us your PowerPoint and we'll help you review it if you want kind of thing. And we'll, we'll try to get you into the list. And uh, also not to forget the uh, uh, LV rug in December for that. Contact Lenny uh, if you're interested in coming to that. Well, we need to get this group posted so I can put updates on what's going on with LV rug anyway. Yeah, Lenny, I was noticing in the chat, there's several people that don't use Facebook. They want to know if we could find a different tool. Well, they suggested LinkedIn. Um, I saw that. Um, yeah. But All of those tools to me don't present things in a sequential order of when things are posted very well, like we used to be able to get with the ARS list. I, I you know, I hate to say it, but I miss the ARS list, <laughs> the, the way it was structured. Even. Yeah, it was pretty convenient. Uh, I got a quick question for everyone um, who's listening. Sure. Uh, has anybody done um, any uh, customization of the Eclipse Studio, that uh, specifically the uh, Remedy Dev Studio, like to uh, create a uh, plugin? I haven't. LJ, are you still mm -hmm. on? Did we lose LJ? Oh, it just takes me a minute to find the mute button. <laughs> Um, I have not created a plugin. Um, I know that there have been a few uh, plugins posted to communities um, that were developed, um, but I myself have not. I've got one on my list of things I'd like to do. <laughs> that's, that's something that I want to do as well. Uh, uh, do you know of any like resources where like you can do a little bit of read up on what needs to be done to uh, to create something like you know? Now, the documentation I read a couple of years ago when I was trying to get this done initially uh, was not what I would call sufficient to uh, develop a plugin from scratch. <laughs> um, so uh, I was planning on using the, uh, it, the, the plugin that exists out there is an outdated version that needs to be updated that I was planning on recreating. That's the migrator plugin that allows you to, uh, you know, from within Remedy or within Dev Studio if you're connected to multiple servers, 
um, say, you know, migrate this object from server A to server B. Um, it is apparently no longer fully functional and needs to be updated and the developer that built it is not uh, part of the community anymore. So I was planning on trying to recreate that and use his as kind of a template on how to get that done. So. Um, yeah, that, that combined with what uh, uh, Kais was showing us, uh, since BMC is saying that eventually Migrator uh, is not going to be uh, supported, uh, I think, beyond the current version, the 2002 version, uh, that you're supposed to use the D2P to move everything uh, between. That D2P is just not the smoothest tool in my opinion to use. I, I really like the way Migrator uh, would automatically, you know, let you configure it to say, yeah, add menus, et cetera, as you migrate things over for a form. Uh, some kind of functionality you could do that from within Dev Studio. I think that would be really great. Yeah, so like I said, I, I, I haven't done it. I know that other people have. I know it's possible. It's just not a uh, realm that I've specifically uh, de delved into. Yeah, our biggest miss is field level migrations that we're going to miss with Migrator because D2TP won't address that. I, we get nervous migrating the whole form because you never know what, if you've got more than one developer messing around in dev, you never know what everybody's doing in there. Yep, I I don't know what you're talking about there. I've I've been through that scenario too. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. So so there's some utilities we've seen in Developer Studio, as LJ was mentioning, in the whole community. Somebody had built a plugin in Developer Studio where you could right mouse click in Developer Studio, highlight a field, and migrate that to to QA. And I, it's it's just a pain to find anything in the communities anymore. I'm with you guys. I I miss ARS list. All right. Yeah. Just maybe jump in. What do you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. Maybe to jump in what uh, Bob said. And thank you, Bob, for mentioning us. Um, I think AR Smarts could be a help there. I mean, you can you can do compare. You can uh, nail down what you compare. You can search for objects that have been modified only by you and things like that. And then you can extract the result of your comparison to a definition file. So clearly at this stage, AR Smarts does not migrate, okay? But you can extract to a definition file and then you can import that definition file. So that might help maybe in some situations. So, so Kais, are you saying that if me, Lenny, and Phil were all modifying the help desk form, and Lenny was doing three fields, I was doing two fields, and, and Phil was doing five fields. I could pull from your tool just the fields I did into a def file and load, load it that way and eliminate theirs? Yes, yes, you can, you, you can extract all the fields that were created by you um, after a given date, for example, and, and, and AR Smarts would export just these fields. Huh. And AR Smarts would put them in, in a definition file. Hmm. That sounds interesting. L LJ, did, does, does that concept of just having those fields in a def file and using Dev Studio to then load that def file, would that put them where you want them on the forms, LJ, do you think? Well, de depending, on, uh, depending on how it structures the def file, obviously um, Dev Studio doesn't allow you to import a field. Dev Studio allows you to import a form. Right. So um, there would have to be a form definition with those fields on it and Assuming, and this is a big assumption because I've never done anything like this, assuming that the um, that you don't check the box that says delete non-existing you know, objects type thing, you know, make it look exactly like the def file. Assuming you don't check that box, in theory, it would just simply import the objects that were in the def file. 
okay. the yeah. form and the field. Um, obviously, the the field would have to have the definition of you know what tabs are you know what what panel is it on that sort of thing. Um, I, I've certainly never tried to do it that way. No, honestly, I've 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 never tried something like that either. But um, I mean, if somebody says that it would have a great added value, that's maybe something we we could look into. You know, why not? Yeah. Every time I've done a field level migration on my own in the past, it was uh, basically grabbing the field off of the source server as a Java object and contacting the destination server with that same Java object and adding it to the form over there. So I never did it um, as a form object with as a you know field in the past but uh um, yeah that's that was one of the great things of migrators you could go in there and say show me all the fields that are different uh between you know dev and production or test and production and you could right click the field and say just move this one field and that's the only one it would move uh, that's that's going to be a missed component uh when they get rid of migrator so um, another option could be uh, in, instead of the traditional dev file, uh, take the take an XML uh, dev file and uh, edit it in Notepad plus plus or something, and just add the ob object that you want to. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of workarounds, but uh... hey, it sounds like we got some things for people to learn to do and show us in Vegas, right, Lenny? What was that? I said, this sounds like we got a lot of things that people need to figure out between now and the Vegas rug and present there. I hope so. I mean, I got quite a few openings. You don't want to hear me on one of the, the tracks do every single hour. So yeah, we're going to work on lab exercises too, but you have to have your own environment for that right now. We may have somebody offer to utilize theirs if we can on some cases. Just a little trick that um, uh, Doug Mueller had showed me once. Uh, uh, we had a stupid requirement uh, for some reason, like to have the request ID field and like, you know, a dialog box in a display only form uh, populated with a set field. And obviously we cannot do that uh, using the Dev Studio because the request ID cannot be set. Uh, you can actually do that uh, uh, by modifying the uh, the... Uh, definition file using an XML out, uh, uh, export. Like, uh, uh, so uh, what Doug had showed me was like use any other field, like a short description field or something that way, and then export that to a, a dev file and just change the field ID at the, the back end, import it back, and the dev studio does not care what you do. It, it actually works. Do you have those steps somewhere lying around that you can share with us, Joe? Uh, sure. I mean, like, uh, uh, what I could do is... Uh, uh, Present it? Yep. All right. See, mm -hmm. there you go, Bob. You got another presenter for next time. There we go. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, I would, I would like to see that in action, see the steps and see it in action. Mm -hmm. It actually works, so it's pretty cool. Okay. So what he told me was uh, uh, the Dev Studio does not have a, a, a mechanism to check what what's in a, a Dev file when it's importing. So you just got to make sure it's like it, it's um, a format, a for, format formatted correctly. All right. Um, I, I want to say thanks to everybody for coming today. Uh, we're at two hours here at this point. I think we've probably done enough of uh, taking all of your time today. Um, Beth, I did see your uh, uh, request up there. I will send out uh, my presentation as a PDF as well, like I did Lenny's earlier uh, and everything. And uh, 
So look forward to seeing all of y'all at the uh, August uh, V-Rug, and it will not be a V-Hug. And uh, I appreciate everybody coming. Thank you uh, to everybody, uh, Kais and Delaney, for presenting today. And uh, we'll see all of y'all later. I'm going to stop recording as of now. All right. Thanks for hosting, Bob. Thanks, Kai. Thank, thank you very much Thanks, for Thanks, giving everybody. us the opportunity to present. And uh, hey, I'll be glad to go back to Vegas, right? It's been yeah. a while. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be booking my flight soon. So hey, I'll, uh, get to, I'll give everybody updates. Can we yeah. have a copy of this rec recording? There were some useful tips that I might want to go through later. Well, we sent the presentations I did. You should have those, but okay. uh, Phil will get the link to everybody. All right, cool. He likes to clean it up. Well, you know, so so I'm 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 a backup guy. I'm I'm a disaster recovery guy, right? <laughs> so Bob has been recording this to the cloud, and I've been recording it to my local PC. So yeah, we should have some link somewhere somehow to get something out. So uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks again, guys. I, I really appreciate everybody doing this. And and Daniel, I saw you. I, oh, Daniel was on the call about ARS list, but I think Mishi had the ARS list on his server somewhere. So anyway, um, yeah, it's yeah. great to kind of virtually be uh you know connected to you guys again yeah me she ran it for the last few years i kind of did the admin but there was just no traffic so it wasn't you know worth him keeping it up there so if we can probably find the platform that's already out there that nobody's hosting that's ideal okay thanks jason <laughs> all right <laughs> thanks everybody Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.